Welcome uh, to the first event of this semester in our U.S.-Japan Short Takes Speaker Series. Our program today is titled Regulating AI in Japan and the United States, and we have two outstanding speakers. Uh, I am Bruce Aronson, Senior Advisor to the Japan Center at the U.S. Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law, and also an adjunct professor there, uh, and I will be the moderator today. Uh, first, I would like to thank our co-sponsor for today's program, the Apex Study Center of Columbia University. And I am delighted to welcome our two speakers. Hiroki Habuka is a research professor at Kyoto University, a graduate school of law, and also CEO of Smart Governance, Inc. And Daniel Francis is a assistant professor at NYU School of Law, uh, where he teaches about uh, antitrust and regulation. Uh, I will skip their impressive resumes because I'm eager to get started on this very timely topic, but I do feel obligated to note that both of our speakers uh, have had direct and important uh, government experience on digital governance issues. Uh, Hiroki at Medi in Japan and Daniel at the FTC in the US. Uh, AI is a very popular topic. We read about it every day. I saw a headline in Barron's Investment Magazine a couple of weeks ago that could have been a subtitle for our talk today. Um, think you've heard enough about AI? It's just getting started. Uh, it seems to be proliferating, fast moving, and hard for non-experts to get a good grip on. Uh, and today, I look forward to our two speakers helping us sort out a number of basic questions related to AI. Um, how is AI developing? What are the benefits and risks? And what issues are important when thinking about regulations? How should it be regulated? And how would we compare the basic approach to regulation in Japan and the US and elsewhere? And finally, who should do the regulating? Uh, what is the best governmental level for regulation and how much international coordination is necessary? Our program today is 60 minutes. We will hear uh, brief presentations from Hiroki and Daniel, uh, and then enter into what I expect will be a free-flowing discussion. Uh, we will respond to as many audience questions as possible, so please use the Q&A icon to send us questions. Uh, let's begin. Uh, Hiroki, thank you for joining us from Japan. Uh, why don't you start? Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Bruce, for the kind introduction. And uh, it's my honor to present a, about AI regulation in Japan here. Uh, thank you for um, joining this session. Um, so uh, first of all, and as an opening remark, I want to introduce Japan's approach to AI regulation. So actually, Japan is one of the most lenient or less regulative countries on AI. There are uh, several reasons for that. Firstly, Japan is facing a severe shortage of workers, leading many to recognize the necessity of utilizing robotic assistance. Uh, secondly, uh, Japan is not the most advanced country in developing AI, unfortunately. So there is no strong appetite to regulate AI at this stage. And also the actual risks of AI have not yet come to a critical level. And finally, the concept of robots or computers coexisting with humans like friends has been a long standing topic in animations or comics. So we have a robot friendly culture. In short, our position is illustrated like this. Uh, first, the objective of AI governance is to optimize the advantage of AI while mediating its risks to a level deemed accept acceptable by so society. Uh, it may sound obvious, but when we discuss AI regulation, uh, many people only focus on uh, the risks of using AI rather than the risks of not using AI. And this is a very important point, I think. The second, uh, we take the sector-specific regulation approach rather than a holistic approach to regulate AI in general. So we take the sector-specific uh, ones. And in this context, I'd like to provoke the most fundamental question, that is, why we need to regulate AI? AI is a system that analyzes data statistically uh, and outputs the most probable output or data or inf information. 
And this is exactly what has been done by human beings in the long history in business situations or public policies. Then why do we have to create a new regulation, especially for AI? Now, this must be the starting point of our discussion. For sure, AI has certain risks and some of them are high. Then what are the high risk activities by AI? Actually, the simple answer would be that high risk activities are the ones that is already regulated. The typical examples are like driving a car, medical devices, or uh, financial services or legal advices. So therefore, if you use AI for, for example, driving a car or a medical device or legal advice, we may need a regulation on that because they are regulated, which means it is high risk. But still, in this case, we may not need to create a new regulation as long as the risk of AI is completely under the control of human beings. For example, recently, Japan's Ministry of Justice announced that using AI for legal services is okay, provided that it is used only by licensed lawyers. Likewise, humans could use generative AI as a tool to generate some regulated works like uh, making a report as long as it complies with Personal Information Protection Act or confidentiality duties. However, there can be uh, instances of high residual risks even with human oversight of AI. For example, Japan has a regulation on medical devices using AI. Even though those AI, medical device AI, is used only by professional doctors, uh, but because the misjudgment of AI could be critical to a patient's life, we have a special regulation on the medical device. And I guess the United States have also the same, uh, the, the, the similar regulation on that. And further, if AI uh, fully substitutes regulated behavior, like level for autonomous driving, we need to create a new regulation for the AI. So this is a uh, one story about uh, 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 already regulated sector specific uh, areas. On the other hand, Japan updates existing regulations to allow use of AI for regulated sectors. Uh, we are very active on that. So now uh, I talked about cases where we use AI for already regulated activities, where we may need uh, to uh, maybe revise or create regulations on AI. So next, Think about activities that are not regulated if performed by human beings. Uh, for example, telling a lie, uh, lying is not illegal except the harmful cases like fraud or false advertising. Then why generative AI should achieve certain accuracy threshold? Or humans are not required to sign a watermark on all documents they created except for some official or important documents. Then why AI content should be watermarked for all content generated, generated by it? The answer is, to be honest, unclear. And that is why we have not yet regulated AI in general. So maybe in the future, if we detect specific risks uh, on democracy or uh, copyright caused by advanced AI systems, then we might regulate that too. But so far, uh, we haven't detected, uh, detected uh, the uh, critical uh, level risks to the society. But yet, it will be helpful for AI developers or operators or users if there are non-binding, flexible guidelines uh, in handling the AI. And therefore, Japan has provided a general AI governance guidelines, which is now being updated. And for both head and soft laws, an uh, agile and multi-stakeholder approach would be necessary considering the speed and the complexity of the technologies or number of stakeholders on the value chains or a lack of predictability and explainability and also various new ethical challenges brought about by AI. So also the international collaboration is essential because AI easily goes beyond the borders. Uh, so we are trying to contribute to international rulemaking through G7 and other fora. So this is Japan's basic approach. So from the next slides, I will talk about more specific details about uh, regulation uh, in, AI, uh, in Japan. So first, we have some regulation that uh, uh, limits use of AI. Uh, first of all, I, as I said, uh, there is no general regulation that constrains the use of AI. 
But there are some uh, a, a, a requirements on using AI. For example, Digital Platform Trans uh, Transparency Act requires large online digital platforms to disclose of key uh, factors determining their search rankings. The Financial Instruments and Exchange Act requires algorithmic high-speed trading businesses to register with the government, as well as to establish the risk management systems and maintain transaction records. And Personal Information Protection Act is also relevant, uh, which is uh, similar to GDPR, uh, and, and it is important for both development and input phases. And then in the next slide, I talk about um, regulation for AI, which means that uh, enabling use of AI in regulatory purposes. Um, uh, the first example is autonomous driving. Uh, we amended Road Traffic Act uh, in April 2023, and this allows certified business certified business. Uh, operators to perform completely autonomous driving without human supervision or intervention under certain conditions, which is called level for autonomous driving. In such cases, the vehicle, not a human, is driving. So the responsibilities held by human uh, drivers have been replaced with safety standards for autonomous driving systems. Additionally, uh, devices that record operational states are mandated for reviewing in case of accidents or malfunctions. In finance sector, the Installment Sales Act, which is for uh, uh, credit card companies, was amended in 2020, allowing certified credit companies to use algorithms for credit assessments. Um, in legal services, AI use is advancing, actually. Uh, so questions have been raised about whether AI-assisted contract drafting and review uh, known as legal tech services constitutes unauthorized practice of law, which is prohibited under the Attorney Act. The Ministry of Justice issued guidelines in August 2023, clarifying that the main functions of currently available contract creation and review services do not violate the Attorney Act. And in healthcare sector, uh, systems for early approval of AI-based diagnostics imaging software are being considered. Uh, systems that assist doctors, such as AI for diagnosis, fall under a so-called software as a medical service and require uh, approval under the Pharmaceutical and Medical Device Act. And this process can take like over five years but reforms to allow sales within a year of development are being discussed. Uh, considering uh, AI's continuous updates, a two-stage system uh, is under uh, discussed, uh, initially allowing sales with minimal examination and later as a second step, re-evaluating approval based on post-use data. The, another example is a um, beyond industry-specific uh, initiatives. Um, there are cross-sectoral uh, situations where AI sub uh, uh, substitution is expected. Uh, these involve what is termed uh, analog regulations, such as uh, mandatory visual inspections, physical audits, regular checks, and on-site regulations. And there are actually over 10,000 laws and notifications mandating analog uh, compliance methods uh, created in the era when human level precision in inspection and safety assurance was actually not feasible by uh, the machines. However, since AI is now capable of higher accuracy in certain uh, tasks, uh, the rationale for limiting these roles to human beings is diminishing. Therefore, uh, the, a collective amendment initiative was conducted by the government uh, uh, digital agency. Uh, uh, and resulting in the amendment of Digital Procedure Act in June 2023. Uh, and in October last year, uh, a technology map listing technologies that can be uh, used uh, or you know, uh, that, that can replace these analog regulations was uh, published. So now the list is uh, available online. So next I talk about Copyright Act. Uh, so copyright is defined as a right that arises in works that creatively express ideas or feelings and belong to the fields of literature, academic, art, or music. And objective data, such as map data, 
uh, machinery operation data or people flow uh, people flow data are not creative expression of ideas or feelings and are generally not considered as copyrighted works. But uh, some or many of image data or text data uh, you, uh, used, to, used to, to train large image or large language models may be copyrighted. And to use uh, uh, to use uh, reproduce or uh, arrange copyrighted works, in principle, a license from the copyright holder is necessary. However, obtaining licenses for all data uh, when developing uh, large language models or large image models involves significant costs. So on this issue, Japan made a groundbreaking legal amendment in 2017, which is actually not so uh, uh, new. Uh, so it's it stipulates that using copyrighted works uh, for AI training by automatically downloading or processing data from the internet uh, or other sources without human enjoyment of the work's expression does not generally constitute copyright infringement. And exceptions apply if uh, it unfairly harms the copyright holder's interests. Also, copyright holders can prohibit such processing. Uh, but still, in many other jurisdictions, the question of whether it is okay to use copyrighted data for machine training, and this has led to uh, Japan being sometimes re referred to as a machine learning paradise. But actually, now uh, the government is uh, discussing uh, 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 in which cases uh, is actually um, uh, unfair use of uh, uh, copyrighted works because when the Copyright Act was amended in 2017, uh, we didn't accept that this kind of high quality generative AI will uh, be in the society. So uh, the future uh, regulation is still not very clear, but so far we have a very broad uh, 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 possibility of using uh, copyrighted works. So, however, this applies only to the AI training stage. So, whether the output of generative AI infringing copyright uh, when it resembles ex existing works is a topic of current debate. And the key issue is interpretation of what it means for AI to rely on exist existing works. And finally, uh, let's discuss what uh, kind of governance should be implemented by each player in AI systems. Uh, given that the risk landscape and environment surrounding AI systems are always subject to change, a governance approach that merely adheres to a set of fixed rules is insufficient. Here, the concept of a dual feedback cycle becomes crucial. Now, this dual feedback cycle refers to uh, two feedback cycles. The first one is the operational level, uh, and which involves assessing and addressing the risks and impacts brought about by AI systems. And the second one, the second cycle, is uh, the management level, which involves evaluating and improving the rules, organizations, and systems that facilitate such assessments and uh, risk assessment and risk treatment. And this left figure is shown in the Japan's AI governance guidelines, but actually almost the same concept is shown in both uh, NIST AI risk management framework and also ISO 31000 or 27000. So this dual, uh, dual feedback cycle concept is now very common in the uh, risk management of uh, uh, complex and uncertain systems. Yes, so uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, and lastly, I prepared, prepared a, a slide for you know, of mapping uh, the comprehensive picture of AI governance, and maybe I can refer to it in the later discussion. Now, now I would like to start our uh, discussion with Daniel and also a great audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hiroki, for that uh, wonderful overview. And I would like to mention uh, to our participants in the audience that Hiroki has kindly consented to uh, allowing us to post his slides as a PDF. They will be on the uh, event page in our website. Uh, and also, if you look at the chat, we have posted a link to Hiroki's article on the CSIS website, which uh, I believe is the best overview of AI regulation in Japan that is currently available. Thank you. Um, Daniel, your opening remarks, please. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a 
pleasure to be with you this evening and a particular pleasure to do it with my very good friend, Habaka Sensei. He and I have been friends and colleagues and collaborators since we met when we were doing tech antitrust enforcement together. Yeah, uh, 2017, 18, yeah. Absolutely <laughs> right. Um, and it's been my pleasure to share a variety of, uh, of experiences with them over the years. And this is a, a highlight. Uh, so I come to this discussion with a lot of humility. I'm an antitrust and competition regulation specialist. Uh, I have some expertise and background in the regulation of tech and tech markets, but almost exclusively from a concern with competition and monopoly. So I want to be very clear from the outset, I am not in any interesting sense an AI expert as such. And I'm usually pretty careful to stay in my competition lane, so it's it's fun to get out a little bit. But I'm going to start with how, at least here in the U.S. antitrust conversation, we might look at AI today. And then I want to zoom out a little bit and talk about the enterprise of regulating this extraordinary, complicated set of very different practices and technologies that we group together under the label of AI. So to start with competition and monopoly, this is a funny moment to gather and think about how we regulate tech monopoly and tech competition. So AI has kind of arrived in a supercharged way on the public policy radar at a time when, at least in the United States, two very broad sets of phenomena are going on. One is a pretty deep and broad reckoning with our tech regulation in general. Long-standing concerns boiling over about data protection and privacy, free speech and content moderation, surveillance, both commercial and governmental, deep concerns about manipulation and deception, again, both in the commercial context and in political settings. Uh, and a kind of background feeling that particularly in the United States, a bunch of our tech markets might be underregulated in some important ways. So in bucket number one, we got what might be a surge of interest in tech regulation as such. And at the same time, we're having what may well turn into a revolution in our thinking about competition and monopoly based on really broad concerns that monopoly power, particularly but not exclusively in tech markets, might be too common for comfort in our economy or too harmful and maybe as a consequence of the fact that our antitrust policy may have been too lax in some respects in the past. So as a consequence of all this, there's a surge at the minute in the United States of calling for very strong competition measures in artificial intelligence. So Eric Posner, who's a brilliant scholar at Chicago, has recently written uh, about AI's threat of reinforcing big tech's dominance of the economy. So he points to things like Microsoft's relationship with OpenAI, the fact that Microsoft and Google are closely involved in different ways uh, in leading the AI conversation. He talks about monopoly at the chip level of the AI stack. Um, Ganesh Sitaraman and Tejas Naranchania have recently launched a, a pretty long and thoughtful piece about an anti-monopoly approach to AI regulation, calling for some pretty dramatic measures Things like universal access, non-discrimination, maybe direct or indirect government participation in the provision of cloud computing. And even the FTC now is raising concerns that the possibilities created by generative AI may spell real harm for competition. So my reaction to those things sort of centered around a couple of things. So thing number one is, I think it's really important in dynamic, complex, fast-moving markets, just as in boring, old-fashioned, traditional ones, that we have really strong, well-funded antitrust enforcement. We got to keep our eyes open for anti-competitive agreements, so exclusive relationships with important AI providers might be a source of concern, exclusion by monopolists, mergers and acquisitions, a natural point for antitrust intervention. And that means regulators are going to have to do a bunch of work to really build channels of knowledge into the market so that they can hear complaints and concerns when they're at an early stage, not when things are too late. Second thing is, I think it is true 
that in some parts of what we might think of as the AI supply chain, so if we think of applications at the very top, and then we think of models a little bit further down, and then under those, we think of the inputs into you know, virtually all of the high profile AI applications and technologies we see. So in particular, very high end graphic processor chips and certain kinds of photolithography. There are some levels of that market where it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of energetic competition. And the easiest place to see that is right there at the chip level. So NVIDIA really does look like it enjoys monopoly power in certain categories of chips, certain suppliers of photolithography likewise. And my reaction to that is that we should do with that just what we do when we see it elsewhere in the economy, which is take a really close look, but not otherwise see it as a basis for competition-led enforcement. We don't leave that kind of thing or tolerate it elsewhere in the economy because those other markets aren't important. They do so, or we do so at least in the United States, because we haven't yet figured out a way to respond to concentrated markets in antitrust in the absence of some identifiable conduct, like exclusionary behavior or mergers. We haven't yet figured out how to do that in a way that would cause more good than harm. So my reaction, certainly to some of the more dramatic suggestions, is nothing would be worse from the point of view of harnessing the benefits of some of this technology than to treat AI right from the get-go, even assuming that we can agree on some definition of the relevant set of technologies, like a public utility and subject it to very aggressive obligations of universal sharing, sort of very intrusive obligations of non-discrimination, and so on. That kind of approach, what we think of as utility style regulation, is something that we do in very specific sets of circumstances. But it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that it's kind of a supercharged remedy for getting additional competition. That's not really the move that lies at the heart of that regulatory strategy. Public utility style regulation is almost always what we pick when we realize we can't have competition in a market sustainably. So for example, railroads, where we were realizing that we were getting this horrible cycle of monopolies and bankruptcy because it wasn't possible in certain ways to have sustainable competition. Um, that's when we intervene and we say, we're going to take a hit, we're going to sacrifice some competition at the layer that we're commanding to be shared. And we're going to do that because we don't think competition can exist sustainably or is worth protecting sustainably at that level. And we hope we're going to get countervailing benefits elsewhere in the market, upstream or downstream. And I don't think we are anywhere close to being in that position in AI technologies yet. And in fact, the place where monopoly power is clearest, so the chip monopolies enjoyed by NVIDIA and maybe a couple other companies and other aspects of the technology, that is as vulnerable to competition as it gets. And it's very clear a number of the big tech companies have announced that they are heading into that market, plowing massive amounts of investment because the last thing they want to do is be subject and captive to the power of an upstream chip monopolist. So when I kind of isolate the things, the strands that I see in common among concerns about bottlenecking or uh, about concentration in the AI stack, I see things that in general are pretty low risk, at least in the medium term. We're talking about computing power, highly skilled labor, certain kinds of access to data, certain kinds of access to capital, now, it might be true that in some cases, in some circumstances, it may be hard to get certain kinds of categories of those things. But in general, you'd have to work pretty hard to come up with inputs that in general were more widely available than at least in the medium term after some supply reactions we might expect for those things to be. So that's a pretty cautious approach particularly to the idea that we should bowl in with very aggressive antitrust remedies. I just want to take a couple minutes and talk about the broader enterprise of AI regulation. So my hot take here, for whatever it's worth, is that we already have quite a lot of AI regulation. We just don't brand it that way, right? We have tort law 
We have consumer protection law. We have the law of policing. We have antitrust. Every single one of those frontiers is going to have to contend in a very specific way with a very different set of technologies and practices in each case. So sometimes this is going to mean we're going to find a totally new problem or a pretty new problem confronting some area of the law, right? Maybe deep fakes or human simulation is one of those. Maybe fully autonomous driving is truly one of those. Uh, there's a second bucket that isn't quite new problems, but it's sort of new or novel versions of old problems for these areas of regulation. So for example, when we see discrimination in hiring or discrimination in policing, uh, or to pick up on something that Hiroki mentioned, when we see lawyers in court who've relied on AI, maybe like some of the folks who've gotten trouble in the United States, the AI has hallucinated some authority. That's kind of a new version of an old problem. Lawyers have been making things up for a long time and getting into trouble for it. And then in a third bucket, it's not so much that the problems or practices are new, it's that the costs and benefits of our existing regulatory accommodations might get rebalanced by AI because some practice becomes easier or cheaper or more ubiquitous. There's a great example in antitrust, which is in the United States, it's not illegal to engage in price discrimination. That is to charge more money to customers who are willing to pay more and charge a lower price to those who might be more elastic, more willing to switch to alternatives. It's pretty easy to live with that rule today. But in a world where every business was able to accurately and costlessly figure out exactly the right amount that it could charge to a customer before that customer switched away, the costs and benefits of full tolerance for price discrimination start to look very different indeed. So in all these different ways, on all these different frontiers, tort lawyers and contract lawyers and lawyers of policing practices and antitrust lawyers are going to have a lot of work to do in the medium term. I think the most useful thing that can be done at the AI-wide level, in some sense at the, the central level or at the highest level, is to think as hard and as creatively as possible about what we can tell today about the shape of changes we're going to get tomorrow. Not because that should feed into an omnibus cross-cutting AI act, where there's a kind of bandwagon effect where everyone agrees that something should be done, but there's no genuine majority for any particular thing to be done. So everyone puts their favorite thing into an omnibus regulatory measure and it gets passed because everyone's relieved to see something done about AI. I know, I'm not sure that's the way forward. Instead, what I would love to see, particularly from central government, is efforts to support what we might think of as informational infrastructure, generation of understanding, of reflection, of research, of policy scholarship around the medium and longer term implications of this technology. And there have been some encouraging signs of that in the United States. I basically take that to be the core approach of the executive order that was recently issued. Very different approach from what we see in Europe and potentially something that's really compatible with what I hear in the Japanese narrative, which is one of incrementalism, it's one of agility, and one of a really careful sector by sector particularism. So why don't I leave it at that for opening comments and then we can, uh, we can lean further in one direction or another as we go on. Thank you, Daniel. Um, let me just get everything started, and then uh, we want to hear from both of you. Um, we had a comment before the presentations from the audience that our title, Regulating AI, sounds like we're emphasizing the risks rather than the benefits, um, but your presentation seemed to be rather the opposite, um, that you were focused on maximizing the positive impact uh, while at the same time trying to strike a balance, um, or as Hiroki put it, regulating for AI, but then at the same time, regulating on AI to deal with the, with the risks. And we're also talking about very specific industries and specific measures uh, as perhaps being most appropriate. Um, is there any room or is there any necessity for some organization to look big picture in terms of the uh, benefits and risks, or should we be content to let individual uh, measures um, work on those things for themselves. 
I was impressed by the wide range of areas and existing areas of law that were covered in both of your presentations. So uh, in, in addition to Daniel's comment about information infrastructure, um, is it necessary to have anyone trying to look bigger picture uh, in terms of the costs and benefits of AI? I'm happy to start very briefly on that, which is just from my little corner of the world, the competition policy world, I think everybody is running around with hair on fire trying to figure out what might be around the corner and what kinds of reflection, what kinds of policy research, what kinds even of sort of technical measures when it comes to empowering enforcement and detection of misconduct. Everybody is rushing around trying to imagine what the short to long term consequences might be. But not a lot of that discussion is informed by people with deep knowledge of the technology or with deep knowledge of what might be coming around the corner um, to the extent that that's discernible today. So I think there is a hugely important value for folks who are close to the technology or who have a more kind of synoptic policy perspective to contribute to this wonderfully bubbling cauldron that, of course, is going to be partly speculative. That is a necessary input to the field by field conversation where we sit down and go, OK, it looks like we may be due for some radical change in the costs and benefits of our tolerance for algorithmic collusion or sort of parallelism through algorithms. Uh, without that general policy and technical information, it's incredibly hard to do that kind of sectoral work. So my view is yes, but it's got to be a complement to the more specialized activity. Hiroki, any thoughts? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the great comments, uh, Daniel. And I completely agree with what you 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 mentioned. And about the balancing problem, uh, uh, yeah, there are a lot of new balancing problems in society. And one of them is actually more uh, broader scale, which is uh, the balancing the goals of competition law and other uh, regulatory goals. Uh, for example, if we talk about content moderation or some safety uh, standards, uh, actually, the big thing company could achieve a better outcome compared with startups because they have developed a great AI to check the content uploaded on the platform. Or if you uh, have the more data, you can basically achieve the better uh, safety. So maybe the big tech companies are, uh, might be uh, good for that. <clears throat> But still, we want some competitions. Um, so, um, and so, and how to balance those different goals? Or uh, I'm not very sure the the goals are different or not. Uh, is actually a, a big social uh, question, I think. And another question is like how to define uh, uh, the fundamental values. For example, um, we value the uh, uh, dignity of human beings or uh, human aut uh, autonomy, but uh, the question is, to what extent we are actually uh, independent and can make an autonomous decisions? Uh, um, for example, as, an, uh, as described by Daniel in the example of uh, price dis discrimination, uh, traditionally, we suppose that uh, uh, human beings are autonomous enough so that we can decide our own uh, preferable price. But actually, uh, the thing is that if we are shown a and optimize price by machines, actually we just tend to accept it. Uh, and we don't usually don't have enough information to uh, really decide what is which is good or bad or cheap or uh, expensive. Uh, so like uh, and, and some some someone might blame that it's kind of a manipulation. But actually traditionally, you know, all advertisements have been a kind of a manipulation where all communication with the machines has been a manipulation. So uh, what do you mean by manipulation is another question. So likewise, we have a lot of actually ethical uh, or fundamental questions in our society and which was clarified by the AI, but actually it's a problem of our own society or our own human beings. So this is um, my comment after listening to your, uh, your discussion. Uh, and for that purpose, I mean, there is no specific answer. So, uh, uh, and, and so we need some democratic, multi stakeholder dialogue on that. And for that purpose, maybe we need a special organization to assess the risks. So, uh, assess the risk not 
only in terms of uh, 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 using ex existing definition of values, but more like you know uh, uh, to to create a new framework to balance and assess the risks and also risk treatment measures. Thank you. You make a wonderful observation about the the concept of manipulation as an AI concern. Uh, and its relationship to advertising, which is ubiquitous in our society. And I think it beautifully illustrates a danger with regulating a technology rather than regulating a policy goal or a function, right? So the European Union, we're waiting to see what the EU's AI Act is going to look like. And perhaps we could talk a little bit more about that later if folks are interested. Um, but they have basically tiered artificial intelligence systems with respect to their perceived risk level, and they've designated as an unacceptably risky AI you know, technology or practice, anything that involves, and the, I think the different texts have put it differently, something like the emotional manipulation of human subjects. So this obviously is the entire advertising industry, right? The purpose of advertising across the economy is to emotionally manipulate human subjects in order to get them to do things that they would not otherwise do. So when you regulate a technology and not a practice or policy goal, you create a disconnect, particularly if the effect is to massively burden or even prohibit the use of AI to do a task that itself would not be unlawful if you did it in a more traditional way, if you did it in a more sort of analog way, then all you end up doing is not only creating in incoherence and inconsistency in your regulatory system, but it's a huge disincentive to use AI for you know, sets of use cases or sets of demand where there might be tremendous social values. So and none of that is an argument against prohibitions. It's an argument against prohibitions that are illogically confined to a single technology, not focused on a function. Thank you, Daniel. I think you already answered my next question, but let me try anyway. Um, one question from the audience was to how would you characterize the different approaches to AI regulation in Japan, the US, and the EU? And particularly, is there some trend or hope for a trend toward convergence among the approaches taken? Hiro, could you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, now, there are uh, a several international cooperation on AI regulation ongoing, and maybe I uh, can introduce some of them. So the one Japan is most uh, uh, investing is the G7 cooperation. So in 2023, so last year, Japan summit, G7 countries agreed to advance international discussions uh, to, to achieve interoperability among different uh, AI regulatory uh, frameworks. Um, so specific methods include like uh, supporting the development of common frameworks in inter international organizations like the OECD, and also promoting the establishment of international tech standards. And if you say tech, it sounds like more uh, achievable among uh, international dialogue because uh, it sounds like uh, something different from a political decision or ethical decision. Uh, and additionally, the launch of the Hiroshima AI process uh, cooperation framework uh, among uh, relevant ministry, ministers uh, for generative AI was declared. And following this, the Hiroshima AI process comprehensive policy framework was uh, formulated in uh, December 2023. So this is the G7 collaboration. And about the US and EU, the two uh, most important countries on the uh, governance of AI, uh, are actually uh, uh, making a good progress in cooperation. Um, at the US EU Trade and Technology Council, TTC, uh, uh, in December 20, uh, 2022, a uh, joint roadmap for the development and operation of trustworthy AI was agreed upon. And it acknowledges the differences in AI governance approaches between the EU and the US, but still agreed on cooperation in areas such as sharing terminology and classification, uh, or developing standards and tools for trustworthy AI, and also monitoring and measuring uh, current and future risk related to AI. So this looks like more you know, closer uh, dialogue compared with uh, privacy dialogue between US and EU uh, once we had. Uh, so I think it's a good progress uh, and it's very good thing that EU and US are uh, 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 somehow collaborating in a good manner. 
and uh, and uh, as a, uh, and as other international cooperation, for example, OECD is making a, its own initiatives uh, and publishing a, a lot of reports on AI governance. And also there is a Council of Europe in Strasbourg, um, where uh, actually not only EU countries, but also Japan and the United States uh, participate as observer countries. And now the uh, Council of Europe is discussing the uh, and drafting an AI treaty and that covers a wide range of elements, including uh, uh, respect of human rights, democracy, the rule of law, transparency, accountability, etc. So maybe we are going to have uh, an international AI treaty in the coming few years. Um, and in Asia, the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement signed by Singapore, Chile, and New Zealand in 2020 uh, mentions the uh, collaboration frameworks for AI governance. And I think that was the first example of international trade agreement agreed upon something on AI. And last year, uh, 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 in November, uh, there was uh, AI Safety Summit hosted by the UK. And there are not only a, a G7 countries, but also 20 countries, uh, including China uh, and also Asian and African and Middle East countries uh, participated and agreed on the Bletchley Declaration, which advocates uh, for the understanding of potential risks posed by frontier AI or advanced AI as the necessity of international cooperation in AI governance. So as I said, there are a lot of existing uh, international uh, uh, cooperation framework on AI governance, but uh, it's actually not very easy to achieve something uh, concrete. I mean, it's super easy to say just, hey, we need uh, to respect human rights, democracy, sustainability, uh, or, or, or rule of law, et cetera. Um, and also, it's super easy to see that we want, we, we agree that our policy approaches are different, but still we need interoperability. It's beautiful. But how to achieve that is a real question. And first of all, uh, as I said in my first remark, uh, there is discussion of whether we need a holistic or general AI regulation or not. Uh, so, and if you if we cannot agree on that, we all need a general AI regulation, uh, then the discussion must go to the sector specific discussion. And the discussion on what uh, safety means in the context of autonomous driving or uh, you know, uh, 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 ad advertising or medical devices, or legal devices, all are different. And uh, so we, we, we cannot uh, agree on the details without specifying the scope of the discussion and the sector. And when it comes to the sector specific dialogue, then uh, there are a lot of different ministers uh, who are interested in the discussion. Um, so, uh, like, I believe that the basic principle level discussion is already over in the past five or six years, and the real question from now is whether each sector specific regulators or stakeholders can agree on specific uh, terms uh, and also uh, thresholds or uh, frameworks on governing each specific sector systems, and I think it's gonna be more uh, like a small step work rather than a remarkable, uh, bri brilliant uh, political achievement uh, covering or, or covering the world. This is my um, overview. I might just add to that, that despite all that rich engagement and the wonderful international policy dialogue that's been happening for many years, you know, since long before ChatGPT was cool, there is remarkable, divergence between the emerging approaches that we're seeing. So we've heard how Japan's undergirding regulatory philosophy here is one of incrementalism, agility, caution, kind of light touch, sectoral specific, often pretty permissive in a sort of wait and see kind of way. So let's start by making sure copyright doesn't suppress too much activity. And then we start to see, gosh, well, maybe it looks like there's more going on than we thought. So in an agile way, we're going to react, respond, maybe revisit that accommodation. The text we seem to be in line for in the European Union takes a radically different approach. So this is exactly the kind of omnibus technology rather than function-based approach that 
chills my blood to some extent. So it takes AI, categorizes it into four risk tiers. Now, right at the top of the risk pyramid, unacceptably risky uh, uses of AI, including even things that can be done without much or any regulation without AI. Um, you know, we've talked, for example, about, you know, the social scoring or emotional manipulation in different ways. You can do that with pens and paper and humans and be just fine. If you use AI, that's totally out of the game. Not saying any of that's particularly attractive, um, but if nothing else, it's a very discontinuous approach to the presence or absence of AI. Then there's this really broad tier of high risk uses of AI that you know, we'll wait and see how it looks at the end, but it looks like it's going to be enormously broad. And uses of AI in this space are going to be subject to a pretty burdensome set of obligations, you know, reporting obligations, transparency obligations, you know, high quality of data sets, um, you know, obligations relating to risk assessments. If you're a government entity thinking about using AI, you have to, you know, conduct a fundamental human rights assessment um, subject to a few exceptions. It's a really dramatic package of behaviors that's going to be imposed regardless of the level and nature of a risk from, you know, one setting to another. It's the presence of the AI tool itself that's the cause of that burden. And as a consequence, it's going to be a huge disincentive to exploring uses of AI, including in some cases where we would all feel really good about certain kinds of experimentation. So I see the United States at the minute as kind of being poised between a European approach and a Japanese approach. So the executive order that President Biden issued in October, I thought was pretty good. It called for a lot of reporting and analysis in a series of really specific and sophisticated ways, calling out regulatory frontiers, everything from national security to labor to policing, where different branches of the federal government need to go away and think real hard about whether and to what extent their corner of the garden is going to be affected by foreseeable technological change. But I also hear rumblings that there's hill interest in an AI bill, and that, that is stimulated and encouraged by what's happening in Europe. And I really fear that there'll be a sense that, oh, of course we must win the AI race, and the way to win the AI race is not to be left behind by Europe. We too must pass a dramatic, omnibus, broad brush AI act. I really fear that that bandwagon might get some momentum behind it, and we will live to regret it. Well, thank you, Daniel. I can't help thinking of a, perhaps a parallel situation for um, uh, climate-related risk disclosure, where Japan started out with very soft law guidelines, although by now, uh, I think most the companies are required to disclose, and the EU started out with very hard law uh, directives, and the US was somewhere in between. So maybe that's not unique um, to AI, but uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful overview. Um, we have a number of questions from the audience. I don't think, I'm sure I can't get to all of them, uh, but let me at least uh, get to one more. Um, well, here's a very current topic, which you might not have a, a response for, um, but recently uh, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, rejected the development of AI technology uh, with the Mark Zuckerberg. Um, any, any, do you happen to have any comments on that? Or we haven't talked about China at all. We don't have to talk specifically about Jack Ma. Um, what about other jurisdictions outside Japan, the US, and the EU? Um, and I guess part of that is uh, if we have these different approaches to regulation, do any of them seem more influential um, globally or to other countries? Um, whether or not you want to limit that or focus on China is up to you. Yeah. Um, actually, China also has a very, very unique approach to AI, AI regulation. So I am not a Chinese expert, but as far as I know, uh, for example, China has a regulation on generative AI, which requires some registration or licensing, and it asks uh, the, out of, uh, the output of the um, generative AI should be harmonized or endorsed uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the core concept of socialism or like that. 
So it's a very unique uh, content regulation. So even though I don't think uh, Western countries or maybe Japan also will take that approach about the political content output, but still that uh, experimental regulation could be uh, a good reference to when we think about uh, the illegal content moderation. Uh, 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 so, uh, and, 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 and so maybe we might uh, have a lot of things to learn from China too. And also about the jurisdictions, uh, Chinese law says uh, this regulation applies uh, to the generative AI that is used in China. But if you don't use this model in China, and if you just export the model, uh, abroad, then this regulation is not applicable. And that's very uh, interesting approach. And in terms of domestic risks, that makes sense. Um, so I, I don't know if it's uh, legitimate in terms of uh, uh, you know, double standards, international uh, law aspects, but at least if you just consider the domestic risks, the Chinese, uh, Chinese approach is very uh, interesting and, and, and unique. And so, um, and, and also China changes regulation in a very fast manner, uh, what could be called like agile approach. And yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm really wondering how the Chinese approach goes with uh, uh, domestic uh, air regulation. Uh, thank you. Um, well, we're already getting to the uh, last few minutes here. Boy, this was fast. Um, so let me, uh, for the final question, let me ask you to take out your crystal balls um, if AI is just getting started and it covers so many different areas and there's different approaches, um, what is your prognosis? Uh, what direction do you think the regulation of AI will be headed in in the near future over the next five years or so? Uh, where do you think we will be uh, down the road? Can I'm I? happy to go first quickly on that. So I have the sense that one of the most, maybe the most dramatic frontier in which AI will make itself sort of felt in some of the ways you describe is when it becomes clear that it will result in massive labor dislocations. So this has been coming for a long time in trucking um, with you know fully autonomous vehicles. But I think we're realizing that there are certain kinds of function that today either are performed by a human or are performed in a much more human intensive way than is foreseeably going to be the case. And humans will move from you know, being sort of more leaned forward to task performance into supervising a, a broader and broader set of you know, task flows from, from one part of the labor economy to the other. And the political and economic consequences of that transition, I think, are going to be seismic. I think it's going to be whole sectors where there's an enormous outflow um, from employment, I think that's going to have like seismic political consequences. It's going to be an election issue. There's going to be calls for what we might think of as small p protectionist legislation to keep AI out of certain sectors. And we're going to have some really hard decisions to make about what that transition will look like, even if only for a, a long, medium term. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Hiroki, do you have any predictions for us? Oh, yes. Um... Uh, I mean, if we really want to make a society uh, that coexists with AI, maybe we have to think about the change of fundamental regulatory models. So the existing regulation was designed for the predictable, uh, predictable or uh, 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 stable society uh, run by autonomous individual humans. But the fact is that you know society is always uncertain, or society has been always uncertain, and human beings are usually you know affected by others' environments or other peoples, um, and so we have to redesign the regulatory in that way. Uh, and actually, the uh, we are not talking about AI regulation, but uh, we are talking about human regulation, uh, and the problems were clarified by AI. So like discrimination or manipulation or populism has been existed in the society. But that was not as clear as uh, now because uh, uh, we didn't have the AI technologies. But because of the AI, now we can get a lot of data and uh, uh, analyze the data swiftly. And that uh, synthesizes or uh, amplifies uh, our discrimination or manipulation or populism, or et cetera. 
So, um, you know, how to make a regulatory model more agile or uh, multi-stakeholder uh, or distributed is a real, real challenge. And I, I don't know which country could uh, do that at first. So now each country is still in the experimental stage. And I'm really looking forward to the future development of a new regulatory model rather than, you know, minor changes of the uh, existing uh, uh, regulations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you both for a very interesting final observations to keep in mind as we all read about what's happening to AI in the future. Unfortunately, our time is already up. Um, I wanna thank the speakers uh, for a wonderful um, discussion. And I would like to thank the audience for joining us. Good night. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much. Have a good night.